Fendi. Um, I will be uh, moderating uh, moderately, and uh, <laughs> I will start at the end and have everybody introduce themselves with the uh, second loudest person on the panel, uh, Michael Bird Collins. Oh, it's for that guy. <laughs> um, my name is Michael Brent Collins. Uh, I'm an international bestseller. I've written close to 40 books, uh, multiple Bram Stoker Award nominee, Whitney finalist, stuff like that. Produced screenwriter. Um, I've also done martial arts for most of my life and got beat up a lot as a kid, which informs the other decision. And uh, for those of you over here, I apologize. I'm not trying to be cool. I can't turn my head very well because I have pins in my neck, which may have also have to do with the martial arts. Um, but you get my good side, so there's that. <laughs> right. When it comes to asking, answer, asking questions, I'll be looking that way. Michael Brent will be looking that way. And we'll have the whole room covered. So. I'm Rebecca Guineer. Um, I write urban fantasy, fantasy romance, sci-fi, um, paranormal romance, steampunk, anything that has a sword or a gun or love in it is pretty much what I write. I'm the president of the Fantasy Futuristic Paranormal Chapter of RWA, from the of America. Um, so many initials. Yeah. <laughs> you try typing all that out, it is really long. Um, I have to do it all the time now. And that's me. Uh, my name is Peter Rulian. I think I'm most known for telling Michael Brent he has loose testicles. <laughs> <laughs> was anybody on the last panel that we were talking about? It was the last panel. Okay. Yeah. It's an in-joke now, yeah. but it will live forever. It's, um, <laughs> we're not that close. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to disavow just because we're... I, I, I am not wearing pants right now, though. Just <laughs> uh, my, my, I write epic fantasy for Tor. My current fantasy series is uh, The Vault of Heaven. I'm working on the third book. I also recently, I, I, I'm very, music matters a ton to me, um, and I listen across the spectrum, but I do love progressive metal. My favorite progressive metal band is Dream Theater, and they just asked me, contacted me to write the novelization of their most recent album, which is a big dystopian uh, concept album. So I'm working on that book as well. My name is John Harmston. The reason I'm here is I am a movie fight choreographer and sometimes writer. I recently rolled a, wrote a, or sold a feature-length screenplay uh, that's in, now in pre-production called Hidden World. And I am the senior instructor for True Edge Academy here in Utah, the largest and oldest Western martial arts group, and also a board member of the Pima Alliance, is historical European martial arts, and um, I've taught uh, Western sword fighting for around 12 years. One of my former students is right now ranked the number one steel longsword defender in, in the U.S. So they give me these seed questions to start. Wait, wait, Bob, really quick. I'm so sorry, but. Just for my benefit, when he said Western martial arts, did anyone else picture like two cowboys thrown down? Because that's what he <laughs> And then he said Western sword play, and I'm like, draw your rape here, bad guy. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's just like, that's the first thing I thought of. Well, well, not a lot of people realize that actually the word martial art <laughs> is Western in origin. Mars, the god of war. Right. Uh, so, you know, martialis. Alex Savante, the French martial art, is, uh, is a Western martial art, correct? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, which is a martial art designed to be used with the rapier in a, in a, in a French sort of way. Anyway. Um, <laughs> French sort of way. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Lots of spitting and eating cheese. Um, uh, I'm Bob Defendi. I wrote Death by Cliche, uh, which is a story about a uh, game designer gets shot in the head by a movie fan and ends up in the worst game of all time, obviously, autobiographical. Um, <laughs> so they gave me these uh, seed questions to ask at the beginning, and I'm going to just toss all of those out the questions and get right to this resource and start asking, uh, how do you choreograph your fight scenes? Um, why don't we start with you and then we'll move on down to the people who probably have less interesting answers. <laughs> 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 putting together a fight scene is that, you know, whether it's up on the screen or in, in, a, in a novel, um, you're trying to accomplish a, a lot of things and, you know, keep the story moving in, during that fight scene, right? 
So you're revealing character, you're advancing plot, you're revealing clues, you're uh, you know, instructing about the, the world as, as, you, as this fight unfolds. Okay? So you can show how good a character is, how competent they are, or how un incompetent they are. And you can kind of set up the rules for your world of you know, exactly how deadly it is, and you know who's capable of being hurt or killed, and, and that type of thing. So, you know, trying to um, take into account all those things, and and also figure out, you know, at the end of this fight scene, what what needs to be the end state? You know, who needs to be dead? Who needs to have moved from one location to another? What do they need to have learned during this process? And you know, start plotting it out from there. If you, if you're just kind of you know, doing it by the seat of your pants without an outline and just like, oh, and then, you know, this person pulls out a sword and then this person shoots a gun and then this person jumps off this ledge. Um, it's not going to, uh, you know, be as coherent and, and you know, impactful as it would be. Do you, uh, do you guys, you've all seen Princess Bride? Yeah. Uh, remember the Inigo, first Amigo Montoya uh, <laughs> sort of fight? And it's like, it's awesome and ridiculous, and takes forever. <laughs> and I said this in the other panel, but what strikes me, I, um, I had never seen real fencing until I was at a, a con in Montana, and Steven Erickson was there, and he did like real fencing. He's a good fencer, and they had this set up. And um, if you watch fencing, when they do those strikes, and some of those like hit you in the chest, like they don't get hurt because they're in padding, and they've got these little balls and all of that, it's fast. And uh, you stick somebody in the chest or in the heart in the space of a, a second and a half. So the thing that bothers me a lot of time, not always, but very often when I'm reading any kind of book that has these fight scenes is they seem to really go on for a long time. And I'm like, is that realistic? Most of the time, not. Like maybe if you have two equally paired or, or skilled fighters, maybe it will drag on. But even a lot of the martial arts, I, I've done a couple of different martial arts, and when you go and you're scoring points in that, those things usually happen very quickly. And if you get hit, uh, I, I was in a kung fu fight one time, and, and we were sparring, and I was I was severely outmatched. And I did one kick. It was the first thing I did. And it was a it was a reverse uh, roundhouse. And before I had even got my head around, the the guy had his had struck me in the temple, and he had pulled just enough that I know that if he hadn't pulled, he could have killed me. Um, so the, my meta point on this is, it's okay if you if, if you kind of create logic for why a fight may take longer, but be very mindful that if you got, if you're dragging it out. That you start to, to test someone's like uh, belief because most fights are, are ended much more quickly. I'm sorry, I'm still part picturing you doing kung fu <laughs> with all his beautiful hair. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Was there a fan? Was there a fan? Oil chest. See now you don't believe him because yeah. you're not close. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're getting so aroused. Right? <laughs> Rebecca, when you uh, like uh, think about your characters, do you um, do you think about their fighting style? Like when you're when you're when you're setting up the fight scenes to begin, like do you attach their fighting style to their character? Um, Absolutely, especially since I write romance, there's always a hero and a heroine. So especially when you're crafting women as a fighter, you have to be very very careful in the things you do. So I don't know how many of you play D and D. I don't know how many of you play Warcraft or any of those amazing games where the women are standing in chainmail about this big and they're wielding a sword twice as long as their body. I love those because they're so absolutely unrealistic. Um, so one thing that for me, I'm sorry, fantasy's over. I'm throwing away my time machine. <laughs> so one thing I have to be, you know, when I, since I do write romance, all of mine have a lot of plot, especially my fairy tales that are set in a fantasy world. There is a lot of sword play. Um, there's a lot of stuff like that. But when, so I always know there's going to be a fight scene, but mine always has to have a reason. There has to be a reason for it. I have to figure out why are they fighting now and what are they, what's the, what are they trying to get to, whether it's a big battle or whether it's just two people. And I always try to be really, really mindful of different styles between a man and a woman because the anatomy is so different. Um, and my husband thinks it's funny when I, like my vampires, when I wrote my dystopian vampires because they don't use swords. Um, I, would, I had one girl, she was being attacked by a, by a guy and she had a ponytail and 
he grabbed her by her ponytail and I had to get her away. And so I ran down to the kitchen. My kids are all making sandwiches. And I'm all, grab my ponytail. My husband's like, what did I just grab my hair? And he's all, are you serious? My kids are all mom. What are you doing? I'm like, I got to check this out and see if I can do it. So I will actually try and see if I can get out of what I'm about to have my character do, whether he has to pin me. And my husband thinks it's great. But, <laughs> you know, my kids are all like, you're going to be writing. Because I'll try and see if I can get him, if I'm pinned to the floor in a certain way. Or if he grabs her by the ponytail, can she turn around? So I always, I always try and act out from a woman's point of view as much of it as I can. Swords don't do well in the house. But, you know, especially... For melee contact, I try and really, really see if it's possible to do the kind of things that need to be done. See, now what I'm imagining is the romance writer saying to her husband, pull my hair! I, <laughs> I was just going to say, it's starting to sound like an anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> it's never an anniversary present when the kids are watching. They're always just like, oh, brother. <laughs> Some well, families. Well, I, and I like that because one of, the, one of my favorite things in that first Born movie, uh, was that they purposely picked a martial art for him that fit his character the best. They picked the most efficient martial art because they knew that Jason Bourne would never waste a calorie in fighting. You know, he'd always take, pick the most efficient movement to achieve any goal. Um, and I thought that said a lot about his character. Um, really quick, um, yeah. can I? Yeah, yeah I'd, I'd love it. First of all, like, think about this, how many times you've seen in a movie a, a woman punch somebody 200 pounds bigger That's and it goes down and, and thought, no. Well, two actresses that I totally buy beating up Andre the Giant are Angelina Jolie mm -hmm. and Maggie Q. Part of that is just they've got kind of a badass thing going on, and part of it is because they both know how to throw a punch for real. Um, so you, it's just an exemplar of how much you can leave the story if the fight mechanics are not working for that milieu. By which I mean, <clears throat> if you're in a hardcore action, book or movie and somebody gets stabbed in the leg, that should be a disabling thing and they're gonna bleed out in the next minute. If you're an Ace Ventura, he can get shot with seven arrows in the leg and it's an excuse for Jim Carrey to run around going ah! for the next eight <laughs> minutes. And so the, the rules differ according to what you're trying to do, but like has already been said, they always fit into the story's purposes, and they have to be integral to the story. If you can remove a fight scene and still have your plot, get rid of it. It has to be so important that if you pull out that fight scene, the plot crumbles. And the other thing is, we, when you said, you asked the question, you asked choreography. And something to be very uh, aware of when you're doing fight scenes, especially realistic ones, is geography. I love the Bourne fights, and I, but I hated the third movie because the camera was so jittery, I had no sense of what was happening or where it was happening. And so it made it impossible for me to value or devalue the fight scenes, which are wonderfully choreographed, and they're very stylized, but the moves they use are, are effective moves in real life. And so you always want to give your reader a sense of this is where it's happening, and this is where each person is, and where their fists or their swords are flying. That doesn't mean you have to describe the whole landscape. Sometimes there's reasons to, but, some, but it mostly means if someone's going to hit you, you either have to be bushwhacked, where you don't know what happened at all, or you have to set it up so that the reader goes, I see where that came from, and it makes sense. And now I can follow the next move, springing <coughs> off that one. Sp yeah, spatial relationships, uh, I struggled with this in, in my first book, and I got called on it. Sorry, I pay more attention to it. The spatial relationships are important. Yeah. Because they say, well, he couldn't have done that because over here you said he's here. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, um, it seems kind of remedial, but you know, go through and just be sure that you're grounding the, the reader in the relationship in terms of distance that they are. Because that will, it will you know, uh, depending on the weapon they're using, or if it's hand-to-hat, -hand, that's, one, that's one thing, but maybe they're using ranged weapons. Um, but you don't throw a dagger if you're standing right in front of somebody. I, I read a book where that's what happened. It's like, well, wait a minute. By the time he raced up here, the other guy would have clocked him and he'd be falling down. Yeah. That's, my, that's my biggest problem with, with movies. Because when you're watching a movie and there's a great fight scene, and somebody falls down, and they're crawling for their weapon, and the other person's just watching them. Yeah. And you're like, really? Two seconds ago you were trying to kill them, and now you're like, let's see if they'll get it. <laughs> it's like, you would stab them. You would, you would shoot them, so... I'm going to talk to you now about the that's... utility of your crawl. As you crawl closer and closer, inches away that you'll never... Oh, crap. 
<laughs> exactly. That's, you know, one thing I, um, I always, when I, I teach a fantasy fight, fighting class, and one thing I always talk about is the magic. How, is, how long is it going to take you to, how long does it take you to do things? How long does it take you to cast that spell at the person who's running at you with a sword? How long does it take you to get your bow and to knock your arrow and to let it go? You're not Legolas. You can't stab them in the eye with, a, with an arrow. I'm sorry. It's, it's really not possible. So, so, you know, you have to think about timing a lot and where your characters are in relationship to each other, but, you know, who's in the way and how long is it going to take people to do certain things. Um, to me, that's, that is always crucial when I'm reading a story is, is the timing correct in how you do that? And I know as a choreographer, everything has to come down so split second to make so somebody doesn't get injured for real. Right, and, and one of my pet peeves is the, the ham-fisted trope you see in almost every sword fighting movie where, that I call banter at the bind. So they, no. you get to the cross blades <laughs> uh. and they're gonna deliver a monologue you know, to each other over a cross blades while they're kind of arm wrestling yeah. you know, <laughs> with their swords. And you know, a bind in a, in a sword fight happens in a split second and then you're reacting out of that, right? And cutting, or moving, or grappling. And so, like, you know, they can open their mouth and they'll get half a syllable of their monologue out and then they're dead, right? So, <laughs> that's just not realistic. But you know what, that, that's a good point because here's what a, fen a real fencing match looks like. <laughs> <laughs> okay, oh, okay. And, and I fenced uh, in college and, and I, did it a lot. I enjoyed the heck out of it. But you also have, but this in a Shakespearean play, by my troth, young Hamlet, <laughs> speak not to me. <laughs> it doesn't work. And so there's a there's a difference between you're, nobody who writes a book or a movie is writing realism. But what you do, so don't ever think I have to write a realistic sword fight or anything that if you really did it, it would look like it happened in the olden days, you know, it, when the Western cowboys were doing their martial arts. <laughs> you, have to, you have to, but you put real elements in there to tag it to reality. And the only reason for that is it's part of the suspension of disbelief process. If you put a real element in, followed by something that looks like it'll hang off of it, even though it's ludicrous, the whole cross swords thing. Because they, you'll notice the cross swords, they don't ever run e toward each other going, ah, it's nice to see you. It's, <laughs> it's built in and they get closer and closer and closer so that when it does finally happen, that part of your brain gets turned off and you can just appreciate that moment. Uh, but it does bother me too. I'm like, do they have like rip tape on their swords that they don't just kind of slide? Well, I would just suggest you, you can talk like, you know, without the swords crossed. Yeah. And, you know, while you're in the, you know, at, at some distance. Got plenty of time to talk. Yeah. So, so all this is about suspension of disbelief. Uh, on, their the, lives. On, on the fencing bit, uh, a lot of the artifact, a, a lot of that bit with the fencing, isn't there a lot of artifice in, in, in competition fencing though? Totally. Because because of the fact that they can't hurt you. Well, yes and no. I mean, a lot. Of, it depends on what kind of fencing you're doing. I mean, a rapier is very different from a bay. A bay and, a, and the saber, and they all have different points. So, like, you know, if you're doing um, rapier or any of the light ones, one of the most unusual things that newcomers are startled by is you'll be fighting someone and it'll go like that, and the other person will go point, and the buzzer will ring, and you're like, dude, he was over my head. And it's because the rapier bends, and they'll flick you on the back, they'll stop right there, and go bing, like that. And it's very surprising. Is that a realistic move? Nah, yes and no. Because if you make somebody bleed a lot from little cuts, they're going to die eventually. Um, it's unreasonable and unusual in that most real fencing fights were like, uh, and one of them died and one of them didn't, but was crippled for life. So, um, sport fencing where hits are measured in nanoseconds is not historical fencing. Clearly, right. So, if if you look at the the historical manuals, you you see that they spend a lot of time talking about how you defend yourself, how you move as to not get stabbed, and you know you're trying to uh, cover your opponent's blade as you're stabbing them, right? And uh, you know what? And, and you're using measure and range to maintain a safe distance, and you're moving in on your terms. 
and you know, engaging their blade and then uh, attacking and then dis quickly disengaging. Now, you can get stabbed. You know, humans are pretty resilient. You can get stabbed a bunch of times and still live. The earliest fence, the earliest rules when they started using pointing weapons or rapiers, um, they would, you know, both both uh, opponents would end up getting 40 stab wounds, walking away from the fight, and then they both die two days later from sepsis. That that was the common, you know, result of a fight, not necessarily someone getting stabbed through the heart, you know, uh, two seconds into the fight, and so. Um, and, and they were also much more brutal than, you, you know, you can decide whether your narrative is going to be very stylized and fantastical with flipping and, and spinning, uh, things that you would never see in a real sword fight, by the way. Um, but then, uh, you know, or, or, or if it's going to be just very gritty and realistic and, you know, like a real duel where you end up grappling and you end up on the ground MMA style and you end up pummeling the guy with the pommel of your sword, where we get the modern term pummeling, and you're busting out his teeth. And the, there's an old saying that you can always tell a, a fencing master by um, the fact that he was missing three teeth and four fingers, because, you know, it, it was a dangerous, a dangerous profession. The, uh, the title of my next novel is going to be The Sword of Sepsis. <laughs> Don't you think that would be awesome? A yeah. couple of things I wanted, as the panels were talking, that occurred to me. Uh, you were talking about, you know, like spell casting and magic use. One of the things that I think it can be really effective is um, a lot of times the, the enemy or the adversary will know about the spell casting. So one of the weaknesses is if there's a time to do that, they can leverage like their understanding of that to make an attack. So understanding the, the you know, how the magic is going to work, make sure that your the opponent is smart about it. Right? Um, because otherwise, the magic is always going to win. Because magic is more powerful and more awesome. Um, so I think that's really important. The other thing, uh, the other thing I was going to say, I completely forgot, was about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So in, in one of my books, I have a, a very high level magic user, um, and he comes into the room and he finds his his daughter with a guy. And he's not very happy about it. So he starts casting this spell, and the guy in the room is a very big guy. And he walks over, and he knocks him down. And his magic is completely useless at that point, because he just knocked him down, and he thinks, I won. Well, the guy pulls out, um, he pulls out some powder that he has, that some magic powder, he blows it out, and he blinds him immediately. His acid hits his face, and he's completely blinded at that moment. So that showed that, yes, the magic can win, but at the same time, by huge they learn how to use it differently later, and he learns how to combat it a little bit better later, but it shows that you do need a balance in there, because magic does always win, and that's not satisfying to a reader. Yeah. If the magic is always going to win, if you know the magic's always going to win, like if you look at something like, just take for instance the Harry Potter books. Those kids were smart. They didn't always use the magic to win, and I loved the rule that they couldn't use magic outside of school, because in that it meant they had to be smart. And that made it more intense, and it upped the stakes, and you wanted to know what were they going to do to get out of these problems, because a lot of them happen outside of the school. So you don't want to use it as a, as, a, as a cheat. Exactly, as a cheat to win. You want to be able to have your, your people be smart and find smart ways out of the problems. I want to point out something to illustrate what John was just saying about the street fighting versus the fencing. Uh, episode one of Star Wars, if you watch that final duel between Darth Maul and Qui-Gon, Look at how Qui-Gon loses. Uh, Qui-Gon's fighting Darth Maul. Uh, Qui-Gon loses because Darth Maul breaks his nose with a street fighting move. Qui-Gon has never been in a real fight in his life. Uh, Darth Maul breaks his nose, stuns him, and kills him. And it's the one move that Qui-Gon is just completely untrained for because he's never actually been in a real fight, whereas Darth Maul has been trained to kill Jedi. Um, and it's, and I, it was like the third time I saw the movie before I noticed it, but it was like a brilliant little bit that Nick Gilliard put in there uh, that kind of showed a, just a, a nice little bit of character um, that just showed the way they had been trained. There was all this little history, just not one little moment. Um, well, the rest of the movie's crap. But, um, <laughs> but that it just, a, just shows how a little bit of choreography can, can really add a lot of depth to, uh, to, to what you're doing. I, I remember the second thing. Um, it doesn't always apply, but uh, I find it effective when 
uh, in the context of a fight, depending on this, how seasoned the, your, your character is, their reaction. If it's their first fight and they kill somebody, they're not just going to walk away blithely, ready to kill my number two guy. Right? There, there's probably going to be some emotional reaction. And even if, even if you could argue that in the real world there'll be so much adrenaline that it wouldn't really hit them or they'd be in shock, like it's a moment where you would suspend, suspend disbelief and you would, you would show that some effects there. There should be some emotional consequence. Now, the other end of that spectrum could be you've got an assassin and they're a cold-blooded killer, and that's chilling in a different way because they killed but, you know, without, without remorse, without empathy, um, and, and you know, they're Hannibal Lecter, and that's got its own set of sort of uh, emotional states. But I think that um, killing blithely is not interesting. Having emotional consequence for that killing um, you know, makes the characters human, and I think them more interesting. Can I, can I add something that feeds into that? And I said it last time. I only have like six smart things to say in my whole universe, so when they put me on repetitive panels about the same thing, I feel really bad, like I'm digging for something new and going, no. <laughs> um, but one really important thing to remember is your, your best, <clears throat> most competent fighter in the world, the guy who's a war hero and has 16 Purple Hearts and a Congressional Medal of, on all that stuff, the way they became so competent was they luckily, pure luck, didn't die the first dozen times that they got shot at or fought with uh, in a real world situation. because. Um, battles are largely decided by luck the first few times you get in it. And even after that, if you're in a, in a huge battle, you know, with a lot of different factors, you can't control, you can, you know, me and Peter can be fighting and he's kicking the crap out of me and some sniper a hundred yards away who he never saw just shoots him and fight over. So, you, it's nice to put the backstory in there. So the example I used was Joe Ledger in the Jonathan Mayberry's, um, uh, Joe Ledger series, which starts with Patient Zero, he is the badassest fighter in the universe. Like, he goes up against Bruce Lee and James Bond and just wipes their own butts with them because he's that good. But you also know the reason he's that good is because his first fight was one where he and his girlfriend got jumped and she was horribly abused. He was beaten up. She killed herself later psychologically destroyed, and every moment of his competence springs from his first loss. And that makes it so much richer every time he beats the crap out of somebody because you see that he didn't start out as a superhero. And superheroes have their own rules of learning and stuff like that, you know, in the, the Superman Lives, which is kind of a terrible movie, but it showed um, young Superman jumping through the fields in his glee and then falling on his face a few times. So they have their own learning curve, but if you can add that history, not as it's, you know, you're not going to stop me and Peter fighting as we saw them. <laughs> it's a good thing that my girlfriend was raped, because otherwise I wouldn't be able to do this. You know, that's not how you do it. But when you build in that, that not just this fight, but this history of fighting, it makes your character into a real person. But well, Joe Ledger can't beat Chuck Norris. <laughs> well, and there's a difference between if, if your character is, is a rank amateur versus a professional killer, right? Because, I, and this is a common mistake I see in fantasy novels, is, you know, the, the action and the fights are described in just, you know, sort of the, the same way throughout the book, a clinical way. But if, if you're looking, if you're in the POV of that amateur versus the POV of the professional, they're thinking about the fight in completely different ways. The amateur is, you know, they're like, oh, okay, uh, I've got a sword, and, uh, you know, okay, I'm going to try this. I'm going to just swing at his head and see what happens, right? And a professional is critiquing what's going on. Okay, just based on the fact that that guy's holding the sword wrong, uh, you know, I I'm just going to assume a tail guard here, and I'm going to wait for him to swing, and then cover and kill him with, you know, a, a, a zord hound. The, and, you know, the, it's, the Princess Bride fight is a spectacular version of that. If you read the book, it is the the dialogue in the movie is direct lift of the book, where it's just talking about the defense and the offensive fencing moves that they're using against one another throughout the entire thing. Um, and they just looked at that straight from the dialogue in the movie. I see you're using Bernetti's defense against me. Well, I figured I saw it fitting considering the rocky terrain, you know. Um, <laughs> So it's always scary when you're when you're facing someone that you're a fighter you're unfamiliar with, right? Because the, you don't know what they're capable of, you don't know their bag of tricks. They might just have one trick, but it's a good one, and it's going to kill you. 
And, and also, if they, amateurs are dangerous too, because yeah. you swing at them, and they don't do what they're supposed to, and they just hack at you at the same time, and you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. you know, they're, they're not following the rules, they're not defending themselves correctly, right? And so that makes them dangerous. It's been said that the, the best duelist in the world isn't afraid of the second best duelist in the world, he's afraid of the worst duelist in the world. Um, let's, um... Actually, can I say something? Sure. One thing you also want to think about, um, just going along lines with all of that, is when you're creating the backstory for your characters that are in, that are going, whether they're going to be fighting a lot or a little, you have to figure out how good they are and where they learned it. Because you don't just pick up a sword and start fighting at a master level. Eric. I mean, that takes... Right. <laughs> <laughs> it takes well, years. Well, dude, and the, and the, what was the for, the new Star Wars movie that J.J. Abrams yeah. did. Right. That, and whether you're using a sword or a gun, like, nothing bothers me more than somebody that's absolutely terrified of guns, has never shot a gun, new Fast and Furious movie, and they give her a gun, and she starts shooting everybody. Like, aims perfectly, is never, like, terrified of guns, and she just can shoot every single person she needs to all of a sudden. That doesn't work. You have to have a reason that, and saying, well, the gods came down and helped them. I actually read one of those. Um, a guy, a, a very good friend of mine who I love to death, he was reading this fantasy story he'd written, and he, it was great, and I was totally into it until the farmer, who had been starving for six months and was so weak he couldn't even pick up the hoe anymore, and the knights come to, his, to take over his land, and he grabs one of their broadswords, and jumps on him and stabs him through his plate mail front and back to the ground. <laughs> then cuts the head off the horse. And I was like, wow, really? Are you sure? Because where did he learn to do that? Well, the gods gave him this gift. And I was all, when did they do that? Because he was starving and couldn't pick up the hoe five seconds ago. So you want to, and you also want to make sure, especially in fantasy, because weapons, very nice weapons, very nice armor, are very expensive. They are not something that that farmer is just going to be having sit around. And if he does have his grandfather's armor, it's not going to fit perfectly. Things, little nuances like that, you want to think about when you're writing those kind of things. Where do they get it? How did they learn it? Um, where is it going to hurt when they put it on? Where is it going to pinch? A lot of times, if I'm doing, if I'm writing a fight scene and not using my husband's help, I'll put on all the layers that my person has and see if I can move that way. And if I have on a sweatshirt and a winter coat and some boots, because I dress up as steampunk, and I have a book with a steampunk captain, and I put all this cool stuff on when I cosplay, and I have an arm cannon, and I have a jet pack, and I have all this stuff made out of real metal. And so it looks really awesome, but I can't move my arm. So there's no way she could ever fight in this thing, because she could never even just pull her sword out. So you need to really take stock of what they're wearing. How is the movement in that thing, and is it even possible? Can I add two things that kind of spring off of that? One is, it, it can be done well, but it is so irritating for me, the digging for strength moment. Like, he's been, the, the Kira's had the crap beaten out of him for the entirety of the face, and then remembers, it's for his mother. <laughs> and stands up and kills the other guy. Like, in real life, you go, um, I remember. And that's it. Because the bad guy who's owned you for the whole fight, he's still going to own you after you remember your mom, or your girlfriend, or your dog, or your money, or whatever it is that makes you dig deep. It can work, but be real careful about it. It is just a really tough thing. The other thing to remember, too, like, all this stuff, that, and I don't disagree, I want to preface, I don't disagree, you should know about, can a person really move in that armor? I mean, knocking a full-dressed knight off the horse meant you won, because he'd lay there like a pill bug. Um, <laughs> but you are not writing, typically, to the top experts in the field, which means you don't have to get it perfect. It just means you have to get it good enough that they don't notice all of your lying. <laughs> <laughs> And that goes back to what I was saying. You pin it to something real that really works, and then, like, Born jumps through the air, across the alley, crashes through the window, rolls, and you know what? All that can happen except the seven-foot jump across, because most people jump like this. <laughs> and, you know, these long leaps are becoming more and more popular, and they're more and more annoying. I don't know if you guys watch it. was like, everybody turned into the Matrix. <laughs> and, and so, but it works, because in that moment, I know Born 
he's just not flying because he doesn't feel like it at that particular moment. <laughs> and everything else he's done worked and was real. So you don't have to write a submarine captain manual if you're writing a sub novel. You have to write a submarine novel that most people buy into. And we do that with real details. What, and you'll, you'll hear that sometimes described as the authentic detail. And you don't need, you only need a couple of them to convince your reader that you know what you're talking about. And it sounds a little bit disingenuous, but it's really not. Um, I, it is good to do tons of research. Most writers, um, they love research, and they'll actually over-index there and, and burn time that they should be using to actually write the book. Because the, the stuff is interesting. Um, but do enough that you can, you can drop those details. Um, I like to call them authentic details because often it's the thing that someone doesn't know. So, so it sounds to them like, that's credible because I've never heard that before. This person really knows what they're talking about. And then when they do the seven foot leap, it's like, well, he already knows what he's talking about. I will stipulate to the truth of that. Cool beans. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I don't think we have time to really get into descriptions. So let, let's just jump into the audience questions. And if you want to ask about descriptions, go ahead. Um, I think you were first. Um, so you talk a lot about like the, the life and death fight scene. How do you go about creating like the apprentice story where it is technically a sparring thing, but like you, you want to make it like they're invested in this, even though they're not necessarily in danger of getting their head ripped off. You can. You, that's where emotional content and humiliation comes in, because that you know, in there's a great scene in Batman Begins where the master is sitting there fighting him with swords on the frozen ice, and Bruce Wayne wants to win more than anything, and, and Liam Neeson is just playing with him. And you can feel Bruce getting angrier and angrier and angrier, and we hurt for him. And even in that moment of triumph where he's like, I beat you, and, and the, you know, his master says, you didn't beat me, you gave up sure footing for an attack. He goes, dink, and Christian Bale falls through. And you know what, even that's wonderful because you can die if you fall through the ice into cold water. And the next scene is, and even there, the master says, here's how you do it. And the whole thing, like, rub your chest, your arms will take care of themselves. That's such baloney, it makes no sense at all. It, you know, but it's said with such confidence. So if it's a master apprentice thing, make it matter to the apprentice. Make the outcome key to his psychological health, his psychological life or death. One, one common trope we see in practice scenes or whatever is that using sharp swords to spar with in sports to learn. I mean, that's so super dangerous. <laughs> that's, that's just completely not something that happens in real life where you're training with sharp swords because, you know, I, I had a finger almost severed by a blunt sword, you know, and a, a sharp sword. You, you, could, you could lose all your fingers on one hand and not even know it, uh, you know, for uh, I, a minute I, into the fight. I almost killed time. another actor on stage with a blunt sword. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sources. Uh, as was mentioned, the, the significant detail the Navy's defense in High Mind's Glory Road, but I've never seen anyone use port before. Where is a good place to find those and reasonably use them? Okay, so um, I'll, I'll give you a website to go to if you, if you want to write this down. So it's wittenauer.com, W-I-K-T-E-N, a U E R dot com. Okay. And this is an <coughs> online website that has taken all of the 14th, 15th, 16th century fighting manuals, textbooks by the Germans, and have transcribed them, translated them, and posted them online. They these fighting manuals came with illustrations, so you know how to do it. And as opposed to turning to other movies and to learn how to sort how sword fighting works, if you look at the, the original man, historical manuals, you'll learn like how they really did it. I would um, I would complement that at the very least with real experts, like this gentleman here. When I was um, uh, in, I consulted with NASA scientists. Uh, in, in, like, you know, when I when I wrote about a, a, a I had Vietnam factoring into a horror book I wrote. I talked to a Vietnam vet, well, several actually. 
What happened is in those conversations, I would make the note of something, a term I'd never heard before, the example I love. Does, it, does anybody know what a park lane is? A what? A park lane. It's a euphemism that the Vietnam veterans used in, in country for cigarettes. And that, that little detail, it actually turned into a whole pot point. And so you can go and talk to somebody who's an expert. I, I, to me, it's a little bit of a shortcut. Because instead of reading eight manuals, I can talk to somebody, and I can describe to them what I'm trying to do. And they can give me very specific feedback um, and expertise on the fight that I want to choreograph or, you know, or the, the situation with a, with a Vietnam veteran. So I, I don't say only do that, but you'll find real people are actually very accommodating. You know, from your writer and you're yeah. trying to get it right. They're, they're, most people will make time because they yeah, they really want to talk about the stuff. <coughs> yeah, they totally do. And and you can look like a total ho homeless person, and they're like thinking you're a terrorist. I've gone to totally protected areas, walked up to the gate, had all these cameras coming, and I go, I'm not a terrorist. I'm an author, <laughs> and I was wondering if I could come in. <laughs> go right in. Another source that's really come into its own is Mr. Google, because it used to be that you had to use um, Boolean search queries, which most of you don't even know what they are, but they're a pain to get any kind of accurate responses. And now you go, literally, you sit down and go, what are good fight resources? I want to do a kick-ass fight, how do I do that? And somebody will have a website devoted to exact, I want to make structures out of cat poop. Catcoopstructures.com. <laughs> even if it doesn't, you'll go someplace where you start learning what better questions are. And eventually, if, you know, you can talk to an expert, but I also recommend you, you branch out on the internet and in the library just because the expert's going to know everything the expert knows, and you'll take it all, and you'll add details for your own story, and you might screw those up because you're not detailing with the expert. So it is nice to get outside help, and then Mr. Google is so helpful. I or Bing. Mr. Bing's a jack. I, I agree. I, I, a lot of times I'll go on YouTube, and I'll, do, I'll go on YouTube and do a search for um, women's self-defense moves, and I'll look that up. My brother's a uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu champion. I used him a lot in one of my books because my girl who'd been raped decided to learn BJJ, so I asked him a ton of questions on it. But you can, he would say they would do this move, this move, this move, but then I would go on YouTube and put those words in so I could see what it looked like. So I could see what she did, what he did, and you know, a lot of them are, are canned, but you get a little bit more of a nuance and see what it looks like, what you're trying to do. That's a really good point. There's more stuff on YouTube than you think. It's a little disturbing. <laughs> <laughs> the cat poop structure session is so weird. <laughs> All right, that's our, that's our five minute warning. Uh, how quick's your question? Am I more of a tour of general information? Okay, perfect. There's a, there's a group on Facebook called the Hema Alliance. And the Hema Alliance? The Hema Alliance, H-E-M-A, it stands for Historical European Martial Arts. Okay. And these are the people who study those manuscripts that, we, that we've been talking about online. And these people actually have fighting groups, and they're real, they're real martial arts. They're not SCA. They're, they're, um, they actually get together, and they seriously study the sparring moves, and they study all of the manuals. And you too can learn to wield a broadsword, like they actually wield a broadsword. Cool. Let's have all of our uh, panelists give a uh, like a final thought and uh, where what we can buy from them and mm -hmm. uh, where we can see them next. Uh, final thought is uh, fight scenes are awesome. They're an incredible way to move plot and character forward, but use them to move plot and character forward. Uh, I'm in the dealer's room. I'm in the very first. Uh, first table as you walk in, my books are like selling out. And that's not saying come over, just like I used to have a mountain and now I have a low mountain, so don't look for tons and tons. Uh, but LTV is my favorite con, it was the first con I ever did. So I have a $200 writing course online, and if you're an LTUE participant, you can come up and get a coupon code for $170 off. So you can get it for 30 bucks. <laughs> I will be at the signing tonight, and then after the signing from 8 to 10, if you want to learn a little bit more about romance, come to the After Dark Romance. You can take one of these cards to remind you. Um, we're doing, we're going to write sex scenes anywhere from G all the way up to the, I'm the M for Mature group. Um, and we're going to play some poker. It's going to be a ton of fun. What kind of poker? Uh, <laughs> it's going to be um, story making poker. Depends on if you're sitting in the G section. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, I will be at the signing tonight. I've got books in the dealer's room, um, and I've got some bookmarks here that you can have as information as well. So if you're interested in learning how to sword fight, check out trueedgeacademy.com. That's the, the club I'm associated with. Uh, you can also look on YouTube and, and search HEMA, which was mentioned uh, earlier. And you'll, you'll get lots of uh, historical fighting techniques and, and sparring matches that you can watch there. And I'm on Facebook. Uh, if you go facebook.com slash Utah Fight Director, uh, you can find me, and I'm happy to you know answer questions if you have uh, to get stuck on a part or want to know something. I forgot my plan. Uh, go ahead. Can I add it? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, this is just, maybe this might be a personal bias, but I really think in addition to advancing plot, and I guess these could be related, um, uh, I like the emotion that's involved in, in fight scenes and the, and the emotional consequences that fall from them whether it's for the person who is victorious or the family of the fallen, um, don't forget that because you'll have a lot of emotional impact which will really, really resonate with you. Absolutely. Uh, Bob Defendi, you can buy my book over at the Taylor's Table, uh, Swatch Mercenary, over in the Divas Room, and I will be at the book signing tonight as well. And let's give a thunderous round of applause to our panelists.